welcome to my next Homebrew Wednesday, Homebrew Wednesday number three. I don't have much updates on my oatmeal stat, obviously it's only been a week or so since I brewed it, or like a week and a half, I'm filming this on Tuesday so I can get the video up on Wednesday, because uh, I'm going to be busy all day tomorrow doing stuff and then going to a beer event, which I'll talk about in a minute at night. So I don't obviously don't have any homebrew around, um, because my, my oatmeal stat or the base for my breakfast stat is still fermenting, but this is the... Sierra Nevada Flipside Red IPA, which I'm enjoying, you know, from the leftovers from Brew Day that my brother brought a six pack of it. Um, but and I'm also drinking it out of my Rattle and Hum mug. Rattle and Hum is a 40 tap awesome craft beer bar here in New York City. If you're ever in New York City, you should visit it. Anyway, so I took well, one update I have with the oatmeal stout is that I took it out of the water bath, which was kind of hectic because I, a little bit of the airlock sanitized water got in there but not all of it um, so I just re replaced it and it, it should be fine you know after it warmed up a bit and activity kind of increased for a couple hours you know it slowed down and I smelled the airlock and it smelled like just like I did before you know smelling through the, the sanitizer water into a little bit of yeasty smell like you would at like a brewery uh, when you walk up to the brewery you smell like the fermenting you know the fermenting beer um, so it smells fine. It doesn't smell like sour or, you know, diacetyl or anything like that from the airlock. So I'm okay with that. I did open it one more time last week because I was worried about it, but it's fine. Um, beautiful crowns and on it. Um, and so next week, uh, this coming Sunday, I'll be racking it to secondary as long as the gravity is where I want it to be. I'm not going to take a huge sample because it's exactly five gallons and I'm transferring it to a six gallon better bottle. So I don't want to risk oxidizing it. And if it, oxidizes, if it oxidizes a little bit, those flavors are okay in darker beers as long as they're not too intense. And plus, the added cocoa nibs and the coffee afterwards, those flavors shouldn't overtake the beer anyway. Because a coffee beer, coffee is always a big flavor. So it should only enhance whatever other good flavors are in there. Anyway. So, you know, so there's no real footage to take of the that beer since the, you know, it was so it's been so weird fermentation for that. I'm just gonna say that out that I don't know what if it's my bucket or the beer. I know it's fermenting because I looked in there a couple of times and saw great crowds in. So I have hardly seen any airlock activity. So if any of you have ever had, brewed an oatmeal cider or a dark beer in general or any beer that. You know, we've hardly seen any airlock activity except for maybe when you press on the lid and, you know, CO2 comes up, you see the lid puffed up up on the bucket. I it's been a really weird fermentation for me. Um, but, um, so next week I'll transfer it, as I said, and then um, tomorrow night, Wednesday night, I'll be going to a, an event called Mystery Brews at another homebrew store in Brooklyn called Bitter and Esther's, which I've actually never been to before, so it'll be cool to check that out. I told them about my blog, and they told me to come down with my wife and check it out, so I'll be doing that. Um, and I have a lot of other beer brewing plans in the future, for the future, but, you know, I've had some ideas mulling around, new recipes, but because those are so far off, about a month off, from coming closer to me being able to show you anything about them, I'm not going to bore you with them right now. Um, the other part of this video, which I'll um, cheers you into, um, I just trimmed the hoses on my my boil kettle, my mash tun, and the high temp hosing for my sparging, you know, that I attached to my bottling bucket uh, to feed the sparge water in. I'm not going to trim my chiller hoses for now just because I like the way they are a little longer. Um, just to move, have a little extra length to move them around. But if I need to trim a foot off in the future, I will. But I guess I'll do one more big brew day, uh, you know, five gallon batch to really test it out and see if it's really bothering me or really a hindrance to my brewing. So I'll cheers you into that footage. Happy Homebrew Wednesday, and I'll see you next week. Cheers. Hey guys, so. As you can see here, I've mocked up my brew system again. I do some brew day where I have my bottling bucket, which is my feeds my is my HLT, uh, and uh, another fermenter bucket supporting it. The cap in like top un inverted in between, so that 
I can support it better. And my mash and my boil kettle. Uh, one thing that I want to show you actually, I put on the end of my high temp hosing is this cool sprayer thing. I found it at Rite Aid for like five bucks and they took out all the gaskets and stuff that were on top so I could shove the hose in. I might actually buy a piece of like a three quarter inch CPVC fitting and three quarter inch tubing just so it could be like more of like a, like a wand. But for now, it should be okay until I can get to Lowe's because I didn't see any CPVC at Home Depot. Um, and I'm not going to order it online just to, just for now. But anyway, even even before when I was using the pan to sparge it with this hose was way too long. And, you know, at some, and I need it to be this height, like on the bucket. So, like, I don't see myself switching it up for, for anything anytime soon. So basically, I want to trim off, and like, oh, of course, but take off this sprayer thing first. But I want to trim off enough that even if I do that thing where I put it down into the mash tun and I use the tin foil over the top instead of sparging over the pan, which if I use this sprayer thing, I'm not going to need the pan because I'll be able to distribute the water more easily and efficiently over the grain bed without having to worry about slowing the flow in the pan or the pan having too many holes. I could just use this as a sprayer. Um, I've seen where someone actually installed the sprayer into the top of their of their um, mash tun, but right now I don't, I'm not feeling that ambitious. You know, it's cool like, so you can like close the top and spray, but then you can't see how the level of the grain bed and you keep having to open it. So I don't see myself doing that, but anytime soon. All right, guys, so as you can see here, the hose is way too long. It's about four feet where it's at. So if I, you know, if I trim, you know, about that much off, I guess, you know, we'll measure it first, obviously. Unless I can know how much I trimmed off. Um, if I trim about, you know, this much off, I should still have enough. So, you know, to spray over the grain bed, you know, and if I just decide to do with the pan instead, I could still have, you know, room. I just won't have four feet. So, from about here to the end. You have about 20 inches, just about. So that's almost two feet off. The hose. I know a scissor is not the best, but you know, let me just double check my measurement. See if I like that land. Yeah, it's pretty good. Should give me some wiggle room. I know a scissor is probably not the best to cut with, but just do it slowly so I don't ruin my hose. That wasn't the smoothest cut, but who's checking? Yeah, that's the cut. It's not the smoothest, but I should still be able to, you know, use it and, sh you know, shove it in there. It's already stretched out for... This hose, it should be perfectly fine. And, uh, yeah. So that's that hose. We'll go on to the next one. Okay, so here we are with my Mash Tons hose. Um, so right now, it's, um, it's going from, as you see, from my Mash Tun to the boil kettle. Um, and, you know, so this is about, you know, the big, the biggest vessel I'd put it in. I mean, I've also put it, you know, into another bucket when I collect the second half of the runnings on a five-gallon batch. Um, but overall, I don't want it to be any longer than it really has to be to put wort into a pot or anything else. And we don't have to worry about oxygen from this because we're going to be boiling, boiling whatever wort comes out of that, or water, whatever comes out of that. So. We're, I'm gonna right now, but it's also at four feet like my other hoses are, and as you can see, and I don't know if you can see, but it goes all the way into the bottom of my boil kettle and more. 
So I don't want to trim it too short because if I change my setup at some point, like if I have the the mask on a on a chair or on, I mean not on a, I mean on something other than a chair, I'm gonna regret trimming my more expensive silicone hosing too much. Okay, so I measured it up on another card table I have here. I can cut, I'm not going to cut off 19 and a quarter inches, but I'm going to cut off 18 inches, which is right about here. So, I'm going to go a little bit below where I was, and then I'll measure the piece to see how much I actually cut off. But silicone should be a little easier to cut with the scissors, so, yeah, boom, right off. So let's measure how much I just snipped off my hose. Did about 17 and a half inches. So I'm not gonna, if I wanna do 18 and I did 17 and a half, it, to me that looks a lot better if you see it in the pot. It, it, it reaches the bottom of the pot, but it doesn't, you know, curve much. So that this less a foot and a half off should be, you know, a little under a foot and a half. I'm not gonna go try to mock up half an inch and cut it off because it's not gonna make a huge difference for in terms of hosing. In terms of other things it might, but for this it's not. So okay, so for my final hose trimming of this, um, we have the silicone hose going from my kettle down into a my bottling bucket, which is the same size as fermenter bucket. So you can see is it goes down and a little bit plus. And over here too, you're not really worrying about oxygen because you want to oxygenate the wart. So I'm going to also, and also, you know, thinking about how much to trim, um, I'll probably do it to, you know, towards the bottom of the bucket. I really don't want to, you know, I mean, I measured before I ordered it. I knew I needed three feet to get from the, from the pot to the floor. So I'll probably cut off like, I don't know, maybe 14 inches. Because, you know, I want to have some flexibility to move it like closer and farther, you know, from the actual oven. It doesn't need to be like literally right there. I want to be able to, where I don't have to kink the hose as much. So, okay, so for this one, I'm going to cut off basically a foot. Because, um, I want to, like I said, I want to give myself some flexibility. So here we go. Boom, right off. That one was not the cleanest cut. Okay, so after the trimming, I came off and I cleaned up the cut. I came off about a quarter of an inch too short. But, um, should be fine. It looks a lot better and easier to handle right now. It doesn't, it reaches to like about three, two or three inches from the bottom of the bucket. So it should give me, you know, the flexibility that I'm looking for, you know, and if I move it towards, right against the oven, it's, you know, also about an inch from the bottom of the bucket, so it should be perfectly fine for a bottle, for, you know, transferring and whatever, it should be not too long, not too short, alright, so that's done with the trimming. Hey Brewtubers, um, I guess I'll include this clip in Homebrew Wednesday for this week. I'm drinking the St. Peter's Winter Ale, so I want to give a shout out to both Craig Tube, who this is like apparently one of the best beers he's ever tried, and to Norfolk Hillbilly, who tried this beer recently, I think, and went to the St. Peter's Brewery when he did all, all those tours recently. And when I, I got a piece of, you know, Got to give them some credit. This beer is actually really surprising. Last time I had Saint, a St. Peter's beer was a long time ago. I think it was when they had those like bottles that looked like you got them from an old pharmacy almost. Like the unique. This is like a more like modern like round bottle. It's still a green bottle. I don't know why they don't put it in brown bottles, but uh, it's a more like typical beer bottle. Other ones were like looks like you were buying an old medicine bottle. But anyway, back to the beer. Uh, this is really good. Like this is a little more, like I've had like Sam Smith's 
So I'm just like drinking out of the Sam Smith's glass. You can see I've actually had Sam Smith's winter warmer, and it's like lackluster. It's not like, not a beer I want to drink in the winter. It's like maybe a fall beer, but it's nothing. There's no flavor in it that really makes you go wow. This beer is like chocolatey, lots of dark fruits, has a good body, and it's only 6.3 out ABV. Yeah, 6.3 ABV, and it has lots of body to it. Not like like an imperial stout slick body, but it's it has a color. It's pretty much opaque, like a ruby red, almost black. With the head leaving nice lacing. It's just a beautiful beer, and uh, you know, cheers to you guys in England. This is a masterpiece of English brewing, and I really feel it's up there with like the Sam Smith's Oatmeal Stout and other beers that we get here in America from England. So. Uh, Again, cheers to Craig Tube and Norfolk Hillbilly.